Gracious God, as we come before you this morning, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for these kids who are up here singing and dancing and sharing with us their heart and, and giving us that excitement that they bring. Lord, we thank you for this time that we've had to worship, to open our eyes and ears to who you're calling us to be. And Lord, we're thankful for your word, your word that continues to give us the understanding of who you are and who you're calling us to be. And Lord, as we delve into your word today, as we delve into it this morning, continue to open our eyes and our ears to who you are. And not just to who you are, Lord, but to who we will be as we see where we are and where you're calling us to go. Lord, open our eyes to that path, open our eyes to, to that journey that we may follow you with our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. In your name. Amen. You ever find yourself wondering if you got it or not? Or you come to that moment, with that aha moment, where it begins to click. And it's like a, a light bulb goes on in your head. And, and, and so maybe for you, that click came when you were learning to tie your shoe. I don't know if you watch young ones tie their shoe. It's like it's all trouble, trouble, and all of a sudden it clicks. And, and they, the light bulb comes on, and they get it. Sometimes, maybe for some of us, it was with, with math. You know, we're in that problem and we're trying to figure out math. Two plus two equals four. As I was looking for a, a, a slide, I had two plus two equals five. And I said, I can't do that. People will be confused. Uh, but it, it, it clicks. Sometimes that math just clicks. Or, or maybe it's one you're reading. Or you've been reading or learning to read or you've been reading for a long time. And all of a sudden, it begins to click for you. That light bulb clicks on. For me, in my journey, there, there's a book that, that was one that was instrumental in my uh, growing up years. And, and, and it, for me, it's what clicked for my faith. It's Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. And, and, and as I was reading this, I don't know, I was probably 9, 10, 11, probably a little too young to read it and understand it, but it made sense to me. As this, this young man, this young uh, person by the name of Christian was leaving the city and on this, on this highway to, to God and, and just walking down, carrying this big, heavy burden with him. And, and I resonated with that story. I resonated with, with that, that character, Christian, and carrying that sack. And it clicked for me. Uh, so this morning we're going to look at uh, Ephesians, we're going to look at another person who had this clicking, who had it going on. And in your worship folder and on the screen behind me will be this morning's scripture. It's Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 10. Would you join me in reading the scripture for today? As for you, you were dead in transgressions and sins. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We're going to resonate a lot with this verse 8, 9, and 10. Because as, as we've been walking on this journey of, of uh, reconnecting, reconnecting to our roots, reconnecting to faith, reconnecting to our heart for God, uh, John Wesley, who is the one who started the Methodist Church, United Methodist, well, the Methodist Church way back in the 1700s, ha had this sermon that he titled The Scriptural Way of, of Salvation. And, and in it he describes faith. And he uses this Ephesians passage, and, and we'll talk about Ephesians for a minute. Ephesians was written by a, a gentleman by the name of, of Paul. 
And this is a depiction of Paul. Paul was a long time ago, about 2,000 years or so, give or take 100 years, uh, uh, was walking around this earth. And, and he would write letters. He would like, write letters to, to people who were following Jesus in different cities. And one of those cities is Ephesus. And, and he went through this journey to Ephesus. And, and while he was there, he, he started a church. He started to share with them what it was to follow God. And, and, and today, Ephesus is still around. It's a little bit more fallen apart. That's uh, uh, kind of what's left of Ephesus. Uh, but it's still a part of our tradition. It's a part of our understanding of who God is because we have this letter Paul wrote to that church. And, and in that letter, he, he's sharing with them and the part that we read today, he says, you know what, you, you have this burden. You're, you're carrying this sack, and, and, and in this sack is, is those uh, desires of the world, the desires of flesh, the, the things that take us away from God. Uh, we call them sin. And, and as we we're, we're, have this sin in our life, uh, John Wesley had this term, he used the term justification. Justification is that, that idea that we are pardoned, that we are forgiven. That, that we don't have to face the punishment. Paul said it earlier in, in that second uh, Ephesians chapter 2, earlier in the 1 through 10, he talked about how that deserving of wrath, that punishment that was there, and that punishment that, that continues to, to be there, but God says, you know what, that's not for you. Because of my love for you, my grace for you, my, my belief in you, there is something different for you. You're not going to face that punishment because I'm going to take that for you. And that's what grace is. That mercy that, that mercy that says that we do not, we, we have a gift that's given to us, something we do not deserve. That God showed us mercy by not having us to, to, to face that wrath. Because we've been forgiven. We've been justified. And in that justified, that, that forgiveness, that, that grace, that God's love that's been given to us, that, that, that we have not earned, it's freely there for us. West, John Wesley would continue to say that as that justification becomes real in our life and in our heart, as we understand that pardon and that forgiveness, we, we move on to another grace. We move on to a, a sanctifying grace. A grace that says that we are holy. A grace that says that you are to be different, that you're going to live into this life and into this pardon, this, into this forgiveness, and you're going to continue to grow in it because that forgiveness is not the end of it. There's this voluntary growth. As Paul put it in his letter, he said, it was by grace you are saved by faith. And then we got to understand what faith is. And this is, comes uh, from Hebrews. It's a, another uh, a letter that was written, um, some think by Paul, to, to, uh, to the Hebrew church. And it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Just let that resonate for, with you for a moment. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Faith is that assurance of things hoped for. What do you hope for? What is it that you've set your hopes on? Is it a life that, that is spiraling downward? Is that what we hope for? Is it a life that, that uh, has, has things in it that, that take away love and, and insert hate? Is that what we're hoping for? I don't know too many kids that, as, as we watched the little ones up here, filled with that passion and energy, I, I didn't see too many of them saying, you know what, I hope that I can grow up and just to be a bump on the log. No, oh, they have a hope that life's going to be different, that life's going to be exciting, that life's going to be fresh, just as it was, as, just as it is now for them. That same hope that we have. That life is going to be fresh, that life's going to be exciting, that, that there's something greater than me. That's what we hope for, isn't it? And if we take a minute and think about it, if we're hoping for that, and hoping for that, and that assurance, that faith is that assurance that what we hope for will be there, and the conviction of things not seen. 
The conviction that life is different, conviction that God is love, that conviction that God has forgiven me, that conviction that opens up that doorway to step through and, and, and know that God is by my side, that Jesus died for me, and, and that in my understanding and my life and this faith that I have, that I will live a life convicted, that Jesus is real and Jesus is here and Jesus is that example for me to be. John Wesley, like I mentioned before, is the, the, the starter of the Methodist Church and, and, and as we talked a little bit before, just he had this uh, uh, moment in Aldersgate. Uh, this moment, because John Wesley, I've shared this story before, but I think it's worth repeating, especially as we're looking at this justification, sanctification, this Ephesians 2, that we are saved by grace through faith. That, that John Wesley understood the Bible. He read the Bible in original languages. He read Greek and understood it. He read Hebrew and he understood it. He read Latin and understood it. He could read German and understand it. He was not a, a, a uh, non-intellectual person. But he was missing something. He was missing something within him. He, 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 would, he would say that, that there was a belief, maybe. But if we take this definition of faith as the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things unseen, I, I don't think Wesley could say that he was a person of faith at that moment. Because there wasn't that assurance. There, there wasn't that conviction. He, he understood the light bulb hadn't clicked completely yet. It was kind of dimming in and out. And, and so this moment at Aldersgate, as he's sitting in that chapel, as he's hearing the words of, of Martin Luther, as he's hearing this commentary in German being read to him, and all of a sudden it clicked. And that light bulb clicked on. And there was this thing that he had hoped for, this assurance of hope for, this assurance that he was saved, this assurance that he was forgiven, this assurance that set him on fire. Because now he had not only this assurance, but he was convicted. He understood that things uh, that he did not see were real. He understood that, that he was saved. He understood that there was a life worth living. He understood that God's love for him was great and was strong and that was just, it was not just for him. It was for all those that he was talking with, speaking with, understanding. And, and this faith, this conviction, this understanding of God was so great in him that as he would go out into the world, as he would go out into England and, and into the surrounding countryside, and he would begin to speak... Thousands would gather around him. Think about that for a moment. You're hearing me through a microphone because my voice isn't very loud, or if I did get louder and you would be able to hear me, I wouldn't be able to talk afterwards. He would stand on a tree stump, and thousands would gather around and listen to him. He didn't have a microphone. He didn't have a way of amplifying his voice other than the natural cavities that, that were there. But they would come and listen. And, and one of the places in England, Bristol, was where he would go, where he went once. And, and out of the mines, the miners would come out to hear him. And, and maybe at first they started to jeer because they've heard all these things before. But his conviction and his assurance and his faith started to come out. And it started to be seen, started to be recognized, and it started to be built back up. And the people would hear him and would say, you know what, we understand this, we want this, we want it to click like it's clicked with you. And so John Wesley, not only was he preaching, but he was also starting up these, ideas, these small groups. He, he started up these classes that he would gather these people in groups of ten and, and, and have them begin to meet to understand what it was to live by faith, to be saved the grace is saved by faith. Not a work on their own. Not something that they could do. Not something that they could physically save themselves. But something that took that faith, that assurance and that conviction. And live into it. Because John Wesley also knew that you couldn't be by yourself and have that faith. 
uh, that assurance and that conviction that you needed others to help you with that, others to help deepen that understanding, uh, others to help you grow deeper and stronger. And that as that growth started to happen and people started to grow and, and the world began to change. That John Wesley is usually the one who's cited for that bloodless revolution in England. In France, they had a bloody revolution that, that, that wiped out, or not wiped out, but they removed by death the ruling class. And John Wesley's, as he was teaching this justification um, and this sanctification, this growth and holiness, this growth into what it is to be that child of God, and people started to see it, their lives were different, and they started to accept the changes that were happening. They started to accept what was becoming around because they lived by the fruit of the Spirit. They, they lived by a, a, a different way, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. They no longer lived by that, that desire of, of, of love, lust, and, and heartache, and hatred, and discord, and envy. They were living a different life because they had come together and they had said, you know what, we are forgiven, but that's not all there is. There's more to this life than just being forgiven. There's an example of God we have in Jesus, and that's our example that we're to live by and to grow by. So how do we do that? How do we get there? How do we have these fruits of the Spirit? And it comes through that sanctifying power of God, that, that love of God, that grace of God, that voluntarily we walk into God's presence. I say, God, I want to be more like you. I, want, I see my brother Jesus and I want to be like him. I want to live and love my neighbor as myself. I want to love you with my, all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. I want to follow after you. If you look at Jesus' life and you see him as he traveled, you know he only traveled for three years, right? He had 30 years of working and 30 years of being in, in society and culture, 30 years of earning a living, 30 years of, of, of helping his family, 30 years of being with his family, his mother and his brothers, 30 years of living life. And even in those three years as he traveled around to different places and different spots, he continued to live, he continued to uh, earn money, he continued to help uh, the disciples live and grow and taught them what it is to follow after God, shared with them parables and shared with them ideas and, and shared with them what God's kingdom is like. He was still in earth, on earth, and he's still living a life. Just because as we grow in that understanding of God and we grow into the fruit of the Spirit, we begin that transformation that happens in our heart and our life, it doesn't mean that we stop living. We still talk to our families and friends. We still, we still are providing for our families. We're still living our life. But instead of living our life for, for ourselves, for me, for egocentric, we live our life for God. We live our life for Jesus. We say, you know what, Jesus, this is who you are. This is who I want to be. Help me down that journey. So we surround ourselves with people who will encourage us and strengthen us and walk with us until we have these fruits, until we have this understanding. And, and you know the beauty of that sanctification, grace, that beauty of that growth is that it's lifelong. It doesn't stop. We don't just arrive. Because as we get it, as that light bulb clicks on, we have this understanding that we are saved by grace through faith. We have that understanding today. And then tomorrow, that understanding gets a little bit deeper. It just isn't, uh, I've been saved. It just isn't accepting and forgiving. It's more. It's looking at my neighbor and seeing who my neighbor is and not just judging my neighbor and, and casting my neighbor aside. It's about loving my neighbor as, as Jesus loves them. As Jesus loves them. It's, it's more about what is happening within. Because what happens within then becomes what happens without on the outside. And it begins to change our life. 
So this, this idea that Wesley gives us, this idea that Paul is sharing with us, this idea that we live into today, this purpose that we have, just isn't that life is all about me. That life goes beyond. That love that God has placed within me, God continues to call me over and over and over and over and over again. God doesn't let me be. He says, I have more for you. I have greater for you. Uh, I have a lot more for you. And then we say, yes, Jesus, you do have more for me. And I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. And I'm forgiven. And I'm set free. And that burden that I carried is no longer there. And then God says, Jesus says, you know, there's more. Come walk with me. Let me show you what else is there. If you really want an understanding of this, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read the four Gospels, the four accounts of Jesus' life, and as you read through them, look, watch the disciples. Watch Andrew and Peter and James and John, and, and, and so I got four, so there's eight more. Watch them as when they first follow Jesus until Jesus dies. Watch how they grow. And watch as Jesus is resurrected and Jesus comes back from the, from, the, from the grave and he says that this is what I've been telling you about. And watch them change even more as that life that they see grows deeper. And that faith, that assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things unseen becomes real within them. That's that's the life Jesus is calling for us as well. That's the life Jesus says, here it is. Follow me. See what I have. See this love I want to share with you and with the world. Be my disciple. Be my student. And show the world by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your witness, and your service that I am more and that I have more. Are you living into this life? Are you getting it? Is it clicking? If it is, share it with somebody. Help them to see and understand. And if it isn't, find someone else that it's clicking with. Find someone else who has that light bulb that's going off and begin to ask them and, and begin to surround yourselves with them so that when that light bulb clicks, others will know and others will see. Because you'll have that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control in your life, now and forever. Amen.